Look deep into your hearts. And you don't have to raise your hand. This is just something for you, between you and God. Do you consider yourself to be a pretty decent Christian, even when nobody's watching? Well, I have another video to share with you, and hopefully you'll come to see the humor in it. And you know the things that seem to be the funniest are the things that are actually true in our lives. You know, it's been said that the truest test of our indicator of our character is on display every week in the church parking lot. <laughs> so let's take a look at this clip and see how many of you can identify with the average thoughts of a worshiper late for church. Jesus, I am late for church. I'm just going to speak this parking spot into existence right now. Just name it and claim it, Jesus. Oh, for heaven's sakes, use the crosswalk. I, okay, I have the fruit of the Spirit, but y'all need to move. Ooh, she is going to wear that into your... Bounce your eyes. Bounce your eyes. Jesus, give me a miracle. I need a ram in the thicket. I love this church. It's just like, come as you are. You know what I'm saying? How do I load though? Does the jacket go with the shirt? Oh, good Lord. Guests, single parents expected mother who doesn't have a parking spot these days i have been here 27 years i deserve respect oh yeah go ahead take my parking spot she listen she probably needs jesus more than me honestly use your mirror how long does it take to back out of a <sighs> jesus give me strength this is so str honestly there better be coffee there better be coffee y'all are gonna make me park in a handicap spot oh look there go the homeschoolers i swear if somebody took the last jelly donut i will don't make me get out of the oh move hey, are that you on the ministry team not today okay oh you're gonna drive a lexus okay i know where your treasure's at not in heaven the sermon series is what putting others in front of yourself oh this doesn't apply to me i mean for heaven's sakes move out of the road look at this truck where are you going a church or a trump rally finally found a parking spot 15 minutes late oh it is way too cold out here but you better bring a shuttle or i will watch this service online well if you peruse the internet very often you've seen this guy before and uh, the interesting thing is he is selling out wherever he goes uh, but he's also being challenged to uh to become more secularized so that he can have a larger kind of audience and his response to that is well they tell you to talk about things you know john is actually one of seven children of a pastor he said church is all i know and so he's got all kind of videos out there but how many of you, don't raise your hands, this is between you and Jesus, how many of you have had those kind of thoughts, whether here at church or even sometimes when we think, um, thanks doc, you didn't have to testify to that one, but, but yeah, I appreciate the honesty, you know, but sometimes we even think when we're out at the mall or the shopping, you know, that we don't have to be as Christian as we do in the parking lot. Or how many of you were trying to get in or out of the parking lot as 1,500 people were trying to leave last week while another 1,300 people were trying to get in and all of them seemed to want the same spot or wouldn't even let you out of the spot that you finally had gotten in? And so the question for us has to do with how are we? When it comes to being a Christian, are we a Christian only when the service is going or are we a Christian all throughout the day, all throughout the season, even in the church parking lot? Well, if you got the sermon to answer this week, then I put a confession in there that uh, this was a little bit of a challenge for me because uh, as we're preparing for this, and as you all know, there's a whole lot that's been going on. There's a whole lot that's going on this weekend and Christmas Eve and all that kind of stuff. In the middle of it, we've been planning our vacation. Uh, how many of you enjoy your vacations? Yeah. How many of them are off? Oftentimes, they're wrapped around family. Can I get an amen? Yeah, that's what we do. It's a lot cheaper to stay at your in-law's house than it is to stay over at Disney World or something like that. And so we've been planning our vacation all around this you know, time and to go up to Georgia and see Chris's family. But suddenly, um, it went from a month ago where it was just going to be a few of us gathering that another part of the family said, well, that sounds pretty fun. We're going to gather there too. And I'm like, Whoa. And then uh, another part of the family said, hey, we're going to come too, and it's all going to be great. And another part of the family was like, holy cow, 
how many people are coming to this thing? And I'm starting to do the math in my head. And while I'm doing that, my blood pressure is going up because there are more families coming than there are bedrooms in this house. I mean, what are we going to do? Where's everybody going to sleep? And can I just tell you, I don't know about your family, but I can tell you about my family, and they're all snorers, <laughs> including me. And so um, we were talking about it, and suddenly the realization is almost here, and everybody's coming from all these things. And finally, at one night this week, I just finally said, enough, stop. I can't think about it anymore. I don't know what the answer is, but I've got to get up tomorrow and write a sermon about peace. <laughs> you have no idea how hard it is to be a pastoral family to get up after struggling. yes. We're real people with real feelings. If you cut us, we bleed. If all the family shows up at one time, it's both good and hell at the same time. <laughs> you know, they say the three, you know, after three days, both fish and family stink. Well, we're all going to be together and we're going to have a great time. <laughs> Somewhere along in here, as we've been talking about this, my, uh, my daughter suggested that I needed counseling. <laughs> and uh, I'll share with you a little bit what my response was that. But I hope you can kind of connect <laughs> with some of these thoughts. And, and, and talking about peace during Advent is either perfect timing or at least ironic because it's one of the most challenging seasons of the year. Why? Because people are involved, whether it's at home, whether it's at church, whether it's in the malls. How many of you actually realize just driving around Spring Hill, there's more people? Where did you people come from? What are you, what are you, what is, why am I so far back from the stoplight? I can't believe this. Where's a shortcut that I can get? If you all would just get out of my way, I could have a Merry Christmas, you know? We get the stress of the season and, and whether it's a, a young parent who's trying to get the last best toy of the season or trying to get that last minute gift for those family members that you didn't know were showing up and suddenly they're showing up and you want everybody to have a Merry Christmas so you're out at midnight on Christmas Eve trying to get that last best gift or present. But maybe, just maybe, it's the perfect time to talk about peace. You know, last weekend we talked about joy. And, and I shared with you that there's a difference and a distinction between happiness and joy. And, and happy has everything to do temporary and circumstances. Our happiness is based upon our circumstances. See, but when you're a Christian, you, you want to think deeper than that. And so we talked about joy and joy in the Lord. And you can have joy when the rest of your world is in chaos. That's why Peter could, could even praise God while he was in chains for Jesus Christ. Well, I want to make that same distinction with peace because peace can either mean something like um, peace with one another Peace at home, peace at family, peace in the church, peace in the parking lot. It, it can mean the absence of war. Uh, sometimes the scripture will say they entered into a time of peace. But, but there's also a deeper understanding of peace, and that's what I really want to get to today. The Hebrew, who knows the Hebrew word for peace? Anybody? Shalom. shalom. That's right. And if you're from the south, it's what? Shalom, y'all. Yeah, uh, but the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And it, it, it was a typical type of greeting for them. And I believe it really is still in, in uh, Jewish communities today. It's still, it, it's kind of like aloha. You say it coming and going. Uh, they say shalom when they're greeting people. And they say shalom when they're leaving one another. Um, some of you may not know this, but even in English cultures, we have words that we want to say, which go to a deeper meaning. Anybody know where we get the word goodbye from? It is a contraction from God be with ye. So when you're saying goodbye, we're saying 
God be with you. God's blessings be with you. How about Hispanic cultures? What do they say? Vaya con Dios, which is, you know, go with God. Or adios, which means to God. And so whatever culture it is, it seems like every culture wants to rain down blessings upon one another. But I want to talk about this this evening because when we're talking about peace, it's a deeper kind of peace than just the happenstance, just the circumstance, or even peace with one another. Now, Jesus talked about peace with one another at a deeper level because it was Jews and Gentiles that were coming together to create this new church. And Paul writes, he, Jesus, is our peace. It means we're coming from different places. We're coming from different cultures. And we have different ideas about what ought to be done. Anybody ever been a part of a church disagreement? (laughs) Oh, you know what? Um, Some years ago, I started a new church. And for a new church, and God bless all the new churches because many of them will attract new believers, even more so. Um, We try to be friendly and connect with people and all that, but sometimes people come in and they don't know our jokes, they don't know our language, they don't know our culture, and everybody seems to share the stories. Remember 37 years ago when we did that? You know, oh, yes. (laughs) But sometimes new churches can, can reach new people for Christ, and so many of them will come, and I started a church you know, some 20 years ago or so. And, and the interesting thing to me is when we got, you know, I kept praying for more and more people to come. God, just fill this place and fill this room and reach more and more people for you. But you know what? The more and more people that came was chaos. Why? And, and I will tell you, it was never the new Christians. It was always the church people. Because they were the ones who had the knowledge of what it ought to be like. You need to do this, and you need to do that. And if you don't do this, if you don't line the rows up this way, then you're not really doing it right as God ordained in Leviticus. Um, No, he didn't. It's what your church did. You're probably here because they got tired of you telling them how to do it, so you join another church. Pastors often say churches be great except for all the people. We could easily say families would be great, (laughs) except for all the people. Shalom. (laughs) Peace that passes all understanding. Why does the Bible talk about peace that passes all understanding? Because people outside of a relationship with God can't understand why someone can be at peace when the rest of their world is in chaos. Shalom is a peace in your heart despite your circumstances. Now, many of you know, we talked about Peter last week. We're talking about another one of my spiritual heroes is the apostle Paul. And like last week, Peter was writing to the church from prison. Well, now we have the Apostle Paul, and and he's writing to the church in Philippi from prison. So if you don't know it, I mean, the church was birthed in Jerusalem, but then the apostles got sent out, sent out throughout the known world at that time, and and where they went, they would start churches along the way, and the Apostle Paul had been sent out and especially commissioned to go to the Gentiles who were anybody but Jews, and, and to reach them for the cause. It was opening up the doors of heaven for any and all who would listen. And he would start a church, and he would spend a year or two with them, but he would train up pastors like, like Timothy, and he would, he would train them up and leave them in charge of the church, and then he would go on. But as kind of an overseer, a patriarch of that church, They would oftentimes write letters back and forth because they couldn't be everywhere at once, and so they would write letters to church. I heard a bishop say recently, God bless the fights within the church. (laughs) Otherwise, we wouldn't have half of the New Testament. But half of the New Testament is written 
because an apostle, a disciple, is writing back in the midst of conflict. <gasps> conflict in the church? Say it ain't so. Yeah, even in the church. This church, in fact, the bishop said, you pastors who think you want to leave one church because somebody's really getting under your skin, guess what? They itinerate. They're waiting for you at the next church you go to. <laughs> Sometimes Christians will leave one church because they're tired of somebody. Then they'll go to another church, and it'll work for a while until you get to know them, right? And then this tension happens within. So Paul who has started this church some time ago, is now writing from a Roman prison, and he's writing uh, to the church in Philippi. Let's take a look now uh, what he has to say in Philippians chapter 4. And I'll be starting with verses 4 um, through 7. He said, I plead with Yodia, and I plead with Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. <laughs> okay, in case you're not catching on, they've been fighting. They've been fighting within the church. And he's saying, get over yourself. Move on. Elevate your eyes. Think about something more important. Agree in Christ. You can disagree about food and circumstances and all the other stuff. Some people in church argue about what you can wear, what you cannot wear, who can come to communion, what is baptism. He's like, no, no, no. Elevate, look above. So he says, I plead with Yodia and I plead with Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who had contended at my side in the cause of the gospel. So these are two ladies who had been with him and preaching and teaching the gospel and now they're not getting along. And so he's writing and as this, he's including to encourage them to get along, all right? Along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Wow. Doesn't that make you think? Doesn't that make you elevate? To think of something bigger than all whatever chaos may be happening in your life. Do you know that if you've accepted Jesus Christ, your name, and probably the name of your person you're in conflict with is written in heaven. It's heartwarming to think that our names are written in the book of life. But she can go to hell, right? We get so frustrated with other people. And yet, yes, there can be conflict even within the life of the church. But to elevate and realize these people whose names are written in the book of life. Verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. I will tell you, I know some of you, and you are very gentle people. I know the rest of you. <laughs> and some of us need to hear that message. That when we really have shalom, when we have the peace that passes all understanding, then we can be at peace when the rest of the world, the church, the pastor, his lives are in chaos. We can still be gentleness. He says, rejoice and let your gentleness be evident to all. Why? For the Lord is near. And then we come to these passages that we all know about. And we think are silly because that's just too much. And he writes, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And then what, here's what happens. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, Philippians is one of my favorite books of the New Testament. And, and so I would encourage you to just, just go back and read it because it really is Paul writing from prison 
one who was in the upper echelon. He was a, from a family of means. He had education. He had position. He had power. He had all the plaques on his wall at home. His mother was so proud. He says, you know what? I leave all that stuff behind. That's just man stuff. That's just worldly stuff. And he says, and I consider all those things of my past, all those what we would consider trophies of this world, he says, I consider them rubbish. I consider them garbage. And yet, here he is in prison, and he writes, rejoice, rejoice. Do you know the, the verb for rejoice in Philippians is used 17 times. How many of you, uh, when you're reading, you, you, if you're like me, um, I'll even show you a demonstration here. I like to highlight. <laughs> I, I like to take a pen. I'll, I'll ask questions, you know, like, what did he mean by that? And, and so I'll have to go back later and look it up and research it. And, you know, so we like to highlight. We like to put an asterisk by it. We like to put underlining. You know how the Bible does that? Back in their day, they would repeat it. And then they would repeat it again. Kind of like the military. <laughs> tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them, then tell them what you told them. Tell them, keep telling them until they get it. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. 17 times from a man who's in prison. And then he's writing back to the church. And he's saying, get beyond your circumstances. And I know what many of you are thinking, because I think the same thing sometimes. And it's like, well, that's nice for most people, but you don't know me. You don't know my life. You don't know my family. You don't know my circumstances. You don't know all the disappointments that I've had, all these things. And, and Paul says, you talking to me? <laughs> you talk, I don't care. You know what he's saying? And, and, and then we, and, he, and he's basically saying it to Yodia and to Syntyche who are arguing inside the church. You know what he says to them? You know what he's saying to us? Get over yourself. Isn't the reason we have conflict is because people won't do what we want them to do. Wouldn't the world be a better place if we could just get them to do what we want them to do? Wouldn't our children, our husbands, our wives, our pastor, you know I get helpful people every week who tell me what I ought to be doing or how I might have done it even better. We all like to be helpful. <laughs> but we get frustrated when things don't go according to plan. I know many years ago, we, we would always, we, we didn't have very much money, especially coming out of seminary and, you know, no income, two kids and, and being in seminary and incurring debt to get into a job, not making very much money at that time. And, and so vacations were very far and few in between. But we had our little nuclear family. We, you know, had a loving wife and, and we had a young son and we had a young daughter and our family was complete. Let's go on a vacation. Not one of them turned out the way that we expected them to. Not one of them looked like it. Our children don't say, you know, remember that time we did that? We go, no, because it rained, got seafood poisoning. Something would happen all the time. Sometimes we get frustrated with one another. But at the end of the day, <laughs> it's because we can't get them to do what we want them to do. Paul is saying, don't worry about it. Don't sweat the small stuff. And most of the stuff y'all fight about, argue about, it's small stuff. He's telling Yodia and Syntyche, to get over themselves and disagree in the Lord. Why do we get frustrated with people? Because they won't do what we want them to do. But you know what? At the end of the day, who are we really worried about? It all comes down to me. 
It comes down to, I'm not getting what I want. You know, part of my frustration this week was all these people gathering together. And, and yes, it's going to be wonderful. And yet, I, I start thinking about the logistics and who's going to be where. And, and then suddenly, I start tensing up. And, you know, and, and, and as I was making my complaints and we're having a conversation and, and my daughter says, you know, you, you need a counselor. And I looked at her with tears in my eyes and said, I am a counselor. <laughs> and so you know what I did? I put myself in time out. <laughs> and I talked to myself. And I told myself all the reasons I was frustrated. And somewhere along the way, the real counselor, <laughs> the Holy Spirit broke in. And I began to realize it was me that was causing the problem. So I did, made, a, made a decision. I had dropped Chris off for work because it was raining that day and I didn't want to be on the bike. So I dropped her off for work and I was going to call her back because I was going to be the bigger man. Proud of myself sometimes when I want to be the bigger man. And, and, I, and I, what, what I was going to call her and say is out of love, honey, I will do whatever you want to do. And then the counselor broke in and said, you already know what she wants to do. Just call her and tell her you'll do it. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> so what did I do? I called her and said, we'll go. We'll go as planned. Because I knew that's what she really wanted to do but yes there are times when even the pastor has to get over himself so here's the key to having peace <laughs> if you haven't heard it yet get over yourself in the name of Jesus <laughs> okay I want you to think about whatever circumstances are going on in your life whatever frustrations are going on in your life and then what does Paul say? He says, don't be anxious for anything. You know who else said that? Jesus. We can't even play, this is just a human. Because that's what a lot of people will do. They'll try to divide the word of God and say, well, if it's not written in red, then Jesus didn't say it. And if we don't like the passage, we said, well, that's what they interpreted him to say. That's not what he really said. Because we don't like what he said. But then sometimes other people will say, well, that's not Jesus. I only listen to things Jesus said. This is the Apostle Paul who was with him and obviously had a deep abiding relationship with him. And he said, don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, everybody say everything, everything, by prayer, I'm convinced we either don't pray enough or we pray the wrong way about the wrong things. But when we will take whatever our frustrations are, we set ourselves aside for a moment, begin to think about other people. They're probably just as frustrated with us. And how can we be the peacemakers? We're called to be the peacemakers. And if we will go to God in prayer and just lay it out before him, he's not surprised. He already knows what we're thinking. He already knows what we ought to do. The question is he wants to know if we're willing to just humble ourselves long enough to come before him, to put our wants aside, to pray about everything, and I'm convinced that if we will do this, then we would worry less about ourselves. I like this definition from C.S. Lewis about humility. He said, humility is not thinking less of ourselves. Okay? There's a lot of you who struggle with self-esteem problems. And every time the Lord says, humble yourself, you go, I know, <laughs> 
I'm terrible. I'm a worm. That's not what God wants either. In fact, the Apostle Paul said, think soberly. Think about yourself the way that God thinks about you. You're his child, and he loves you. Humility is not thinking less of ourselves, but thinking of ourselves less. You get that? Humility is not thinking less of ourselves, but thinking of ourselves less. I'm convinced that if we will put it aside, if we will put it into prayer, if we would be more concerned with other people, we will have much fewer frustrations, anxiety in our lives. And then finally is to trust God in everything. God is for us. He is not against us. And Scripture promises us that he will work all things together for good. So sometimes we, we think, well, why did I have to go through this? Why did I have to go through that? Why did I have to go to that struggle? But if you're honest with yourself, you learn something about yourself through it. Or it drove you into a deeper relationship with God. The scripture says God does not cause, but he allows testing in our lives. And you go, I knew it. God doesn't test you, but he allows it to happen in your lives because we know we run up against things that are bigger than us and we can't change it. And so it drives us to our knees. It drives us into prayer and to put all things before God. And when you come through something and your faith is intact, many times it comes through even stronger than before and this is the future element of peace this is the kind of peace that passes all understanding sometimes I'll, I'll <laughs> we had a gentleman in our church some about a year ago um, he was an elderly gentleman and um, he had already buried two of his wives be, because of cancer and then he got cancer and I was speaking with him, and I said, oh, I'm so sorry. He goes, ain't it great? <laughs> I was like, excuse me? He says, I'm old, I'm tired, I buried two wives, I'm ready to go. It's all about the attitude. And he actually was looking forward to the next step in his life of being with Jesus. You see, he was looking beyond the circumstances. He was looking beyond this world. And he was ready for the prize. He was ready for the glory. So this is the future element of it. And so God's telling us, chill, relax. Don't worry about things that you can't control. For God is in control. He has our backs. And if we will just covenant together to get over ourselves, pray about everything, and trust God for everything, then we will have. That's the promise out of this passage. We will have the peace that passes all understanding now and forevermore. Amen?